Welcome back. Throughout this course, we've had many occasions to learn about iron as a structural material. In our lecture on engineering materials, we learned about the very different mechanical properties of cast and wrought iron. We saw that cast iron, strong in compression and weak in tension, was fundamentally different from all previous structural materials in that it's poured into a mold to create structural elements. This characteristic meant that significant cost saving could be achieved by, by minimizing the amount of material in a member, a major incentive for the adoption of science-based design methods by practicing engineers. And we saw that wrought iron and its younger cousin, steel, enabled the creation of monumental arches, suspension bridges, and trusses that simply wouldn't have been possible without the tensile strength that these materials provide. Today we'll see how iron influenced building design during the late 18th and 19th centuries. This is a rags to riches story, starting with the sporadic use of iron elements as substitutes for stone and timber, but culminating in the world's great skyscrapers. But before we can begin this story, we need to first understand the concept of a frame, an assembly of structural elements that supports a building in the same way that a skeleton supports the human body. So let's have a look at a frame. This is a frame, and the first thing I'd like you to notice about it is that it is not a truss. As you'll recall, a truss is a rigid framework of structural elements composed of interconnected triangles, arranged such that all of the elements in the structure carry load either in axial tension or compression. So a frame then is distinguished from a truss as being an assembly of elements in which at least one member is carrying load in flexure. So for example, within this frame, which we might imagine is part of the structural system of a building, this horizontal beam would more than likely support a floor. And if it's supporting a floor, that would mean that vertical loads would be applied to that beam in the downward direction and clearly would cause the beam to bend. That bending behavior means that this structural element or collection of structural elements is a frame. Similarly, when wind strikes the side of this building and pushes on it laterally, you'll notice that the columns of the building are clearly bending quite significantly. The beams are actually bending too, though they're somewhat stiffer so that the bending isn't quite as apparent in the demonstration. But in practice, in response to that lateral load, every element of this structure is in flexure. That behavior qualifies this structure as a frame. Now there are two basic types of frames, rigid frames and braced frames. This is a rigid frame. The fundamental characteristic of a rigid frame that distinguishes it from the braced frame is that it attains its stability from specially constructed rigid connections. And the key characteristic of these connections is that members are joined together in a manner that causes them to retain their relationship with respect to each other. So if two members are joined together perpendicularly, no matter how the structure is loaded, they will remain perpendicular with respect to each other. Focus in on this joint up here where two beams framed together to, uh, with a column, where, where three members are joined together, and note, of course, that they are all uh, in a perpendicular arrangement. The two beams are horizontal, the column is vertical. When we load the structure, watch that connection and notice that the members retain their relationship with respect to each other. Even after the structure is loaded, they remain perpendicular. That's the fundamental behavioral characteristic of a frame, and it is the rigidity of those connections that causes the frame to be stable and to be able to carry load. Now, here's an example of one of those rigid connections in a real structure. This is a connection between a column and a beam. And what you should notice about it is that it attains its rigidity through very robust attachments of the flanges and the web of that beam to the flange of the column. 
either through heavy bolted connections or through welded connections. That's the key element that makes a rigid frame rigid. Now let's look at that second type of frame, the braced frame. This, of course, is a braced frame. And clearly the distinguishing characteristic of the braced frame is that it does in fact have diagonal bracing which is the source of lateral stability for this frame. In fact, it's very clear that diagonal bracing is the source of stability for this frame because if I remove that lateral bracing, you'll see very quickly that the frame is incapable of carrying any load at all. And when we see that behavior of the frame, it makes it very clear that that fundamental characteristic of the rigid frame clearly is not present here. In the braced frame, the connections do not retain their relationship with respect to each other under load. They're actually fully capable of rotating with respect to each other. And that's why the brace frame must have bracing in order to achieve an appropriate level of stability. Um, now, you may be uh, wondering as you look at this arrangement, and let me restore one of the braced panels here just so the frame will stand up on its own. As you, as you look at this structure, you may be asking yourself, well, isn't this a truss? Or isn't it the same as a truss? Isn't it carrying load the same way as a truss? Well, in practice, a braced frame is similar to a truss in that it takes advantage of the inherent stability in the triangular geometric form. But you must notice that there is uh, uh, a significant difference between the braced frame and a truss. Um, first of all, notice that not all members are connected together with pin joints. The columns run continuously from the bottom of the structure to the top. They run continuously through this joint and are not connected to each other by uh, pinned connections. Uh, perhaps the most important characteristic of the brace frame that distinguishes it from a truss is that many members in the frame carry load in flexure. Once again, if this is a, a framing system for a building, then the floor loads applied to this level of the floor are pushing down laterally on the member itself and causing it to bend. So clearly we see similarities between brace frames and trusses, but they are not the same thing. Uh, before we leave the brace frame, I would like to add that there is an alternative form of bracing. It's called the shear wall. And we'll have some cause to look at shear walls and how they behave a little bit later on. For now, let's simply demonstrate how they work. A shear wall is a braced frame which is created by building the bracing not with individual diagonal members, but rather by filling the entire panel with a concrete wall. And you can see that that concrete wall has exactly the same effect as the bracing does. It stabilizes the frame and gives it the capability to carry lateral loads. Frames are all around us. This chair is a frame, as is this light fixture. And while we haven't talked specifically about framed structures yet, we've actually already seen an excellent example of one, the Gothic Cathedral. Here's that cathedral model that I used back in lecture 12 when we talked about how the Gothic structural system works. And note that while this structural system incorporates a roof truss, all of the remaining elements in the structure carry both axial compression and some bending. And so this system is most definitely a frame. Now that we know what a frame is, we're ready to start talking about iron framed buildings. As I've mentioned previously, the first known use of an iron structural component in a building was a set of cast iron columns that was used to support the hood over a cooking hearth of a Cistercian monastery constructed in 1752. Now this was clearly an isolated application of iron, probably related to the fact that the Cistercians had an interest as a monastic order in metallurgy. Still, the use of iron for a cooking hearth is quite significant because the desire for fireproof construction strongly influenced the systematic integration of iron into building construction a few decades later. In the late 18th century in France, the increasing popularity of theater, opera, and concert music led to a boom in theater construction. And after several disastrous theater fires, building, uh, builders began experimenting with the use of iron in structures, 
as a means of fireproofing them. The Théâtre Français, built in 1790 in Paris, was probably the world's first public building that was purposefully designed to be fully fire resistant. Now, most of its fire resistant elements were actually stone and terracotta, but the interior columns were cast iron. And more significantly, the building used the world's first wrought iron roof trusses. They weren't scientifically designed, and indeed, Iron was used in this application not so much because it was seen as a potential structural innovation, but rather because it was seen as more fire resistant than a wooden truss would have been. Still, every innovation starts with an idea, and this well-known building must certainly have helped establish the idea that iron could be used in structural applications that no one had considered previously. Now, during this period, builders began advertising the use of iron as fireproof construction. I need to emphasize that this was entirely marketing hype. No construction material is truly fireproof, and iron is no more fire resistant than stone. Indeed, even the Théâtre Francais suffered a major fire in 1900 and had to be rebuilt. But iron is much more fire resistant than wood. And remember that before wrought iron came along, wood was the only construction material capable of carrying significant tension. So the use of iron trusses and beams as substitutes for wooden trusses and beams really did constitute a big improvement in fire resistance, even if iron isn't fireproof per se. The Théâtre Francais was an important engineering landmark, but the decisive stimulus for the systematic integration of iron into building structures was the rapid growth of the textile industry in Britain during the mid-18th century. By 1780, the industry was booming. Many textile mills were in operation, and the risk of fire was becoming a serious problem. Most mill buildings of that era used brick, masonry, exterior walls. But all of the interior structural elements at that time, the floors, the beams, and the columns were made of wood. Mills were filled with highly flammable fibers and lubricating oils, and the machines themselves created sparks while they were in operation. So under these conditions, fires were inevitable and potentially devastating. The Albion Flour Mill Fire of 1791 was particularly disastrous, as rapidly spreading flames caused the loss of a few key interior columns within the building, triggering a progressive collapse of the entire five-story structure. Such losses and the resulting increases in insurance premiums provided a powerful economic incentive for change. And the instrument of change was iron. This drawing shows a typical late 18th century mill. Note that this six-story structure is subdivided into hundreds of nearly identical bays. When I refer to bays, I'm talking about the rectangular modules that make up the structure. Because of this configuration, there could be considerable cost savings in using standardized structural elements and then optimizing the design of each one. Even a slight reduction in the weight of a column or a beam could result in large savings because that element would be replicated many times throughout the building. Now, the earliest effort to use iron in a comprehensive framing system was designed by William Strutt for his mill at Derby in 1793. Unfortunately, this mill has now been torn down, but you can get some sense of the external appearance from this photo of a similar structure that Strutt built a few years later. In any case, what really mattered about Strutt's mill was inside. As this 3D model shows, the structural system of Strutt's landmark building used cruciform cast iron columns supporting wooden beams. The beams were sheathed in iron to improve their fire resistance. The floors consisted of jack arches. Those are flat brick vaults supported on bevels that were added to the sides of the beam, as you can see here. And then iron tie rods were used to restrain the thrust of those arches. Above the jack arches was a layer of sand topped with a brick tile floor. This was an exceptionally well-conceived structural system in its own right, but it also served as the jump-off point for a series of progressively more effective innovations. In 1797, an associate of Struts named Charles Bage 
built a new mill at Shrewsbury. In this mill, Beige replaced Strutt's wooden beams with cast iron and thus created the world's first fully integrated iron-framed building, a structure that even today is advertised as the father of the modern skyscraper. Beige also broke new ground by using simple mechanics theory to calculate the required size of those cruciform cast iron columns. This may have been the first time in history that scientific theory was actually applied to the design of a structural element. All of this from a self-educated engineer who spent most of his formative years as a wine merchant. From this point forward, we see a steady progression of structural in innovations and refinements in virtually every component of that iron frame structural system that we're seeing in these mill buildings. The process came to fruition in the extraordinary structural system designed by an iron master named William Fairbairn and his mathematician colleague, Eaton Hodgkinson, for Orles Mill, constructed in 1834. Let's have a look at a 3D model of this system. Note that the cast iron columns have hollow circular cross sections, which is far more efficient in resisting buckling than solid columns would have been. Note also that the iron tie rods that uh, restrain the thrust of the jack arches are now entirely embedded within those arches to improve both fire resistance and appearance. But the most impressive element of this system is the beam, which was designed by Hodgkinson, the mathematician, who purposefully applied scientific principles to determine every aspect of this structural element. Now, we looked briefly at Hodgkinson's rationally designed beam back in lecture six, but now let's pull it out of our 3D model of the structural system and have a closer look. First, Looking at our model from the end, note that the beam has an asymmetrical I-shaped cross-section with a small top flange and a much larger bottom flange. Why the difference in sizes? Well, recall that a simply supported beam experiences tension on the bottom and compression on the top. If the cross-section is symmetrical, like this I-shape, then the compressive stress on the top is equal to the tensile stress on the bottom. But remember that cast iron is quite weak in tension, so the strength of an I-shaped cast iron beam would always be controlled by its bottom flange. So if we subject the beam to progressively larger load until it failed, the bottom flange would fail in tension, and at that point, the top flange would be stressed at much less than the compressive strength of the material because cast iron is much stronger in compression. So in effect, most of the iron in the top flange would be wasted or underutilized. So Hodgkinson figured out that he could make the top flange much smaller without reducing the strength of the beam at all. A smaller beam uses less iron and therefore is proportionately less expensive. So how much smaller should that top flange be? Well, Hodgkinson reasoned quite correctly that the cross-sectional areas of the two flanges should be proportional to the relative strengths of cast iron in tension and compression. Cast iron is about six times stronger in compression than in tension, and so the top flange is six times smaller than the bottom flange. This cross-section simply couldn't be more efficient. Now let's spin my model around for a side view, and note that the profile of the beam is parabolic resulting in greater depth at mid-span than out at the ends. It is perfectly proportioned to the variation of internal moment along the length of a uniformly loaded beam, just as we discussed in Lecture 6. The perfect proportions of this beam design alone reduced the cost of iron in Orles Mill by 20 to 30 percent. More importantly, Hodgkinson's design demonstrated the undeniable value of science-based design and this greatly accelerated its use in later buildings. If it's possible for a cast iron beam to be called a masterpiece, this one was a masterpiece. Despite their plain appearance and utilitarian origins, these early British mill buildings are some of the world's great structures, in part because they're important milestones in a developmental process that will ultimately lead us to the modern skyscraper but also because they're innovative structures in their own right. Remember, structural innovation is one of the criteria for greatness that we discussed back in lecture one.
Although the 18th and 19th century British mill buildings used innovative iron framing inside, all of them continued to use traditional masonry outer walls. And like all masonry walls of this era, they weren't just architectural enclosures, they were also structural elements, bearing walls that carry a portion of the load coming from both the floor and the roof down to the building foundations in axial compression, just like columns. So the next logical step in this evolution of building design, starting with the early mills and ending with the skyscrapers, was to replace these masonry walls with iron. In the 1840s, Daniel Badger earned considerable notoriety for his cast iron facades, which he installed on many buildings in New York City. The E.V. Howitt building of 1857 is a fine example. These iron fronts became so popular in one particular area of New York City that it came to be called the Cast Iron District. Over 200 cast iron facades can still be found there today. And though this district eventually acquired the very trendy nickname Soho, it'll always be the Cast Iron District to me. By the way, don't be misled by the term facade as it's traditionally applied in these structures. The iron wall in the front of the Howitt building is a structural element, a bearing wall that carries load in exactly the same way as the masonry wall that it replaced. Now Badger normally installed his cast iron facades only on the fronts of buildings, but we've already seen a case where iron was used on all four walls, and that's the iron storage building at Waterfleet Arsenal, believed to be the oldest all iron building in the US. In this structural system, the cast iron walls are fully integrated within a well-conceived system of iron roof trusses, columns, and beams. So now only one step remains in the development of a fully iron framed structural system. And that step is replacement of the solid iron wall with iron columns and beams. Among the very first buildings to use fully iron framed structural systems were a series of ship sheds built for the Royal Navy at the Chatham Dockyard in Kent. These structures were intended to provide shelter for construction and maintenance of naval vessels. While they're modest, utilitarian buildings, they demonstrated a very high degree of structural sophistication. In this particular building, you can see the iron framing in the exterior wall, columns, beams, and braces. In this system, the iron members are carrying all of the loads, the walls that you see on the face of the building are just infill to protect the interior of the building from the weather. And also note that there are diagonal members, which mean that this system is a braced frame. It may seem odd to claim that a naval maintenance building is the immediate precursor to the modern skyscraper, but if you can see and understand structure, then you'll be able to see that the there is a clear path from Chatham Dockyard all the way to the Empire State Building. Now, ship sheds were specialized structures, and so perhaps it made sense that they would have a unique structural configuration. But for most buildings of the 19th century, there really was no compelling reason to deviate from the traditional masonry exterior walls. The building would need an exterior wall anyway, just to keep the weather out. So why duplicate the wall's function with iron beams and columns? But this perspective changed dramatically when buildings grew taller as they did in New York City and Chicago in the 1870s. As a building gets taller, load-bearing exterior walls must necessarily get thicker in order to ensure their stability. When the building height approaches about 10 stories, the walls will inevitably become so thick that they begin to impinge on the floor space of the building. Remember the Campanile in the Piazza San Marco in Venice? Back in lecture four, we saw that the tower's height of over 300 feet required masonry walls 12 feet thick, resulting in almost no usable floor space inside the tower. Now, of course, a tower doesn't really need a lot of interior floor space, but a building certainly does. So as buildings grew taller, the development of an alternative to masonry bearing walls became increasingly important. But why did buildings grow taller anyway? Well, the answer is somewhat different in the two major centers of skyscraper development, New York City and Chicago. In New York, a post-Civil War economic boom created huge demand for office space. Manhattan is located on an island, and when there's no longer any room to expand outward, the only alternative is to expand 
upward. In Chicago, the driver was the great Chicago fire of 1871. In the aftermath of that fire, new buildings had to be constructed quickly and floor space had to be maximized. Masonry construction was inherently slow and so the building boom demanded faster construction methods. In both cities, commercial building developers sought to achieve the best possible return on their capital investment. Designers responded in three ways. First, by reducing wall thickness to gain more floor space for any given building footprint. Second, by increasing window size and story height to enhance natural lighting. And third, by adding more stories. And so, buildings got taller. These demands represented a very significant structural challenge. The answer to this challenge was to replace traditional masonry construction with full integrated iron framing. This process occurred in three phases. First, this initial phase is represented by the Equitable Life Assurance Building constructed in 1870 in New York City. To maximize floor space in this building, the engineer, George Post, adopted all of those structural innovations that had been developed for the British mill buildings earlier in the century. Iron roof trusses, columns, and beams with brick jack arch floors. This building was only five stories tall, so Post was still able to use traditional masonry construction for the exterior walls. Of course, at only five stories, the equitable building can hardly be considered a skyscraper. But still, it was an important first step. The second phase of development is represented by the first lighter building, constructed in 1879 in Chicago. This structure was designed by William LeBaron Jenny, the greatest pioneer of early skyscraper development that the history of structural engineering was to see. In this particular seven-story building, Jenny still used a masonry exterior wall, but he placed iron columns just inside the walls. And then the floor beams were supported on these columns, not on the exterior walls. The benefit of this system was that the load on the walls was substantially reduced. So the walls now needed to carry only their own weight and could be substantially thinner. Thinner walls allowed for more floor space, particularly on the lower floors. And now, the final phase in this development process was realized in Jenny's Home Insurance Building, which was built in 1885. This 10-story structure was a landmark in engineering, a true integrated skeleton frame with exterior masonry walls supported directly on the iron and steel frame at each floor level. So here the transition is complete. Instead of exterior bearing walls supporting the iron frame, the iron frame is now supporting the exterior walls. The walls have stopped functioning as elements of the structural system and rather have become a true facade. This system maximized internal floor space and it had the added advantage of eliminating problems with differing rates of thermal expansion in iron and masonry. The home insurance building also used steel for the structural frame above the sixth floor, a first for buildings in the United States. Had this structure been constructed entirely of traditional masonry, it would have weighed three times as much. The lighter weight resulted in lower cost for the structural materials, as well as substantially cheaper foundations. Through its innovative frame design, the home insurance building paved the way for significantly taller buildings. And by introducing the non-load-bearing exterior facade, it opened the door to entirely new methods and materials for facade construction to include the all-glass facades of the late 20th century. Sadly, all three of these landmark structures are no longer with us. Post's equitable building was destroyed by fire in 1912. Jenny's first lighter was demolished in 1972, and his home insurance building was demolished in 1931. Fortunately, some important pioneering buildings from this era have survived, and we'll look very closely at one of them, Lewis Sullivan's Wainwright building next lecture. More importantly, even though these pioneering buildings are gone, their structural innovations live on in every steel frame structure built today. Not just the skyscrapers, but every modern office building you'll encounter in any city in the world. An important reason why we're learning about these historically great structures 
is to better understand the ordinary structures all around us. Structures that invariably incorporate innovations that have derived from their predecessors. Overall, tremendous advances in building design occurred in the 18th and 19th centuries in Britain and in post-Civil War America. These advances were driven primarily by economics as mill owners and developers realized that they could only achieve a favorable return on investment by designing efficient buildings. Over time, efficiency came to be defined first as fireproof structure, then as minimum material cost, and finally as maximum usable floor area for a given building footprint. These forms of efficiency could only be achieved by making engineering goals central to the building design process. This concept hardly seems novel by today's standards, but at the time it ran counter to the well-established European Beaux-Arts tradition in which architects worked alone. And we've seen that when engineering was central to the design process, engineering innovations happened. The result was a profusion of great buildings that emphasized structure and function over form. If you don't find these buildings to be particularly beautiful, well, it's because beauty wasn't really the point. Now, over time, the situation changed. Designers of tall buildings sought greater architectural expression, as we can clearly see in the next generation of skyscrapers, like the Chrysler Building. And at the same time, the designers of traditional Beaux-Arts and Gothic Revival buildings began incorporating more modern structural technology. For example, this is Bartlett Hall, an academic building at my own institution, West Point. And although it was built in 1911 and appears to be a traditional stone bearing wall structure, it actually has a full, relatively modern structural steel frame and reinforced concrete floor system. But in that first generation of iron frames, from British mills to American proto-skyscrapers, unique economic conditions and structural demands led to a certain simplicity and structural clarity that's both interesting and instructive. These buildings achieved efficiency through innovation by fostering the steady transition from load-bearing masonry to iron and steel frame skeleton systems. Next lecture, we'll see how these developments set the stage for the spectacular growth of the skyscraper in the 20th century. Until then, thank you.